Good evening, and welcome to Theater Masterpieces. I'm your humble host, William Roberts. Now, last week, we looked at the book To Have and Have Not by Ernest Hemingway and the various ways this story has been acted on the stage. It was, in a word, astonishing. Just one second. But tonight, I have a special book for you. The Federal Acquisition Regulation. A riveting story indeed. It has drama, intrigue, suspense, but most importantly, it is written to have a happy ending. The main character, someone called the customer. <laughs> Interesting. Now, this customer needs something. It has to be of a certain quality, delivered in a certain time, suspenseful, and at something called a reasonable price. What is at stake? Well, this is what makes this painfully suspenseful. Every single person in this country pays money, and therefore the nation becomes the stakeholder. The dangers? Waste, abuse, and mission failures. Yes, the dangers are real. Whew. The enemy of our story is a bureaucracy of confusion. The heroes? The humble acquisition team. Now, my pamper derriere was on the edge of my restoration hardware divan. This team overcame odds to deliver the services to the customer and the stakeholders, and in the end, got the bang for their buck. But not without challenges along the way. Now, particularly riveting is this conflicting dichotomy between meeting the best value needs of the customer on the one hand and complying with the myriad of regulations on the other. And I have a chart to explain this point. Sarah? Ah, yes. Can you please hand me that chart over there? Yes, thank you, Sarah. You serve me so well. Is this why you asked me to wear this? Yeah, you're my maid in this video. Sarah, let us take a moment to consider the oft-neglected part one in the FAR. Specifically, let's look at the guiding principles outlined in FAR Part 1.102. Cambridge Dictionary defines a guiding principle as an idea that influences you very much when making a decision or considering a matter. Well, that makes sense. We need principles that guide us in making the right decisions as we work to comply with all the other detailed rules. So far, so good, pun intended. But look, the FAR states more than guiding principles. It actually begins with a vision in 102A. The vision should be the North Star, the horizon point that keeps us in the right direction as we work to fulfill the rest of the FAR's regulations. If we are trying to be true to the book, but we can't see the North Star, well, we're not really interpreting the FAR correctly, right? So, let's look at FAR's vision as stated in FAR 1.102A. Now, in the FAR's vision, there are two major components in the first sentence. One, delivering a timely best value thing to the customer. And two, following the rules. I'm going to add some emphasis to the same language to help draw this out. The first one, the vision is to deliver a, on a timely basis, the best value product or services to the customer, effective delivery. While number two, is maintaining the public's trust and fulfilling public policy objectives or rule compliance. Now, you see from this chart here that these two major elements often appear in conflict, and it's helpful to look at them on two different sides of a scale. Oftentimes, however, we ignore the need to balance the two and we overemphasize rule compliance as a justification for not providing timely delivery to the customer. But note that the policy compliance is placed secondary to the value to the customer. The vision is to satisfy the customer, placed first while complying with the policies. And I think that placement is intentional. Maintaining public trust, compliance with public policy is very important, and we must handle the regulations so as not to violate the trust, but the timely delivery to the customer is the first element of the vision and the priority because this is our story and this is our happy ending. 
While the book itself may have a happy ending, I am, alas, not a book reviewer. My passion is to look at how various stories are portrayed in the theater. And this is where things get baffling. Now it's true that a play is never as good as the book, but I was surprised to see how so many theaters deviated from the principles in FAR Part 1. I traveled to various stages around the country to observe and review the ways the book is played out. I even visited the famed five-sided theater to observe their portrayal of this marvelous story. The seats were sometimes very obscure, and I often felt like I was in the scene. Knock, knock. Hey, Ron. Listen, the customer's complaining you're dragging your feet on releasing her RFP. She says you're not even answering her calls anymore. Yeah, well, she hasn't given me her requirements package yet. The cost estimate is terrible. The work statement, it's lame. Okay, well, is that what's holding everything up? Does she need some help from us or any guidance? Our rules can be hard to follow, Ron. We're supposed to be a team- Oh, so you want me to start doing her job? No, Ron, that's not what I'm saying. Calm down. Fascinating interpretation of FAR Part 1. There is another element of the FAR's vision. Participants in the acquisition process should work together as a team. Now. Who is the team that needs to work so closely together? Just the contracting officer and contract specialists, right? Not quite. 1.102C defines the team as not only representatives of the technical supply and procurement communities, but also the customers they serve and the contractors who provide the products and services. The team includes the customers they serve, end users, and the contractors. So the FAR's vision is to ensure close teamwork and communication with end users and contractors. Does your contract office prioritize this? Do you? In 1.102-3 and 1.102-4, it talks about open communication and sharing the vision. A teamwork sometimes means that you have to reach across the aisles, not by doing someone's job, but just by being a team player that helps the team get things done. If you draw your lines in the sand too harshly, you'll draw the FAR's vision right off the map and ruin your story. Now, the way they portray the heroes of the story as disjointed workers strays from the book indeed, but the deviations did not stop there. Boss, listen, I know how we can do this really quick. I wanna use a new type of contract approach that our office doesn't normally do. Here, check this out. See that right there? We can do that and cut out the time by six months. We've never done this before. Why do you want to do this? What's your approach? Because it's fast and we don't have to compete or anything. So we can just knock it out, you know? Yeah, Ron, I don't know. You're not really giving me confidence here. Whatever you do needs to be reviewed by your direct supervisor, policy, legal, and me. In fact, I'm probably going to have to make another office policy about reviews so these ideas don't slip through. But I'm the CEO. I have the warrant. Not fair. Another mind-boggling interpretation of the role of the contracting officer. The final element of the FAR's vision in 1.102A is that participants must be empowered to make decisions. Now this refers to localized decision making. And I believe the intent here is to create efficiency to ensure timely delivery to our main character, the customer. So, does this mean that a CO should be empowered to make the decisions in his or her area of responsibility? Can't the supervisor veto the decision? Can legal counsel move beyond legal advice and veto decisions? Isn't that why we have upper level reviews? The FAR says no. Now the CO must be someone that is trusted to make decisions. But the FAR confirms this in 1.102-4B by stating that the authority to make decisions and the accountability for the decision will be delegated to the lowest level within the system, consistent with law. Now, peer reviews, upper level reviews, and legal reviews, they make good common sense, but they should not be practiced in a manner that extinguishes the decision-making power 
to the lowest localized level. That is demoralizing and very much against the FAR's vision. In order to learn more about the extent of these deviations from the book, I had the opportunity to invite one of the leading directors of the FAR to my library for an exclusive interview. Mr. Franz, why are all of your productions deviating so much from the FAR? The COs are not trusted, nor should they be the way you portray them. The team does not work together, the rules seem to overpower the mission. Why no happy ending? Right, right. Well, it's simple, really. The book is okay, but it's too basic. Things work too well. Customer satisfaction is out. Drama is in, man. People want tragedy. The audience doesn't want a happy ending. They want taxpayer dollars wasted. They want conflict. So we strip the CEOs of their power, make them paper pushers. We take away team communication, best value delivery then. It's never assured. It's my artistic expression of creating uncertainty. And why shouldn't the bureaucracy win sometimes? Okay, well, the book version states that the heroes conduct business with integrity, fairness, and openness. To obtain public trust, all of your characters seem to lack openness, refusing to talk to others in the team and hiding important pieces of information that could help others. Why do your actors take this direction? It's all part of the intrigue. I'm adding mystery. Mr. Franz allowed me to sneak in and observe a writing session of the playwriters. Now these are the people who take the FAR book and all its principles and apply them to the government office stages across the world. All right, all right, how about this? What if we make the CEO and the CEO's representative not like each other, like, at all. <laughs> Love it. We can have the CEO give the core all this paperwork to do, like a requirements package, and the core's like, I need help, I need help. And the CEO's like, no. <laughs> hey guys, what if we make the CEO and the core work together um, for planning and requirements so it comes out really good? Get out. Yep. All right, I think that's good. Let's get some food. I'm starving. Yeah, sounds good. Oh, hold on a second. Now the industry character, the company. Yeah, we forgot to write the company character into the story. Let me think. Oh, I'm so hungry. Okay, how about this? The acquisition team doesn't even talk to the other companies at all. They do all the planning themselves and don't involve them. Yeah, I don't know. Seems like industry is a pretty big character in the story. Can we write them out entirely? I'm really hungry. Let's write them out. Okay. This is going to be weird. Mr. Franz, I noticed that you really don't include industry engagement in your interpretations, which seem like a big deviation from the focus of this book. In 1.102A4, it says that the government must not hesitate to communicate with industry as early as possible to determine the capabilities available in the marketplace. And they are permitted and encouraged to engage in responsible, constructive exchanges with industry within the bounds of the law. Huh. Well, it also says, as long as it doesn't violate laws or promote unfair competition. We really focus on that last part to make our contracting our characters super scared to talk to industry. Scary cells. Okay. <clears throat> what if, hypothetically, you were to write a play for one of your government theaters that follows the book and its principles in FAR Part 1 exactly? A literal interpretation. That's wild. You mean the acquisition team works and communicates really well so that all their diverse skills are utilized for planning and execution? Yes. And the team focuses on value to the customer as much as the legal compliance and engages in heavy collaboration with industry? Yes, exactly. And the CEO is trusted by her leaders 
to make the right choices in her area of expertise. Because she is trained to be a procurement champion. Precisely. Uh, I don't see it. Where's the tragedy? <sighs> well, there you have it, viewers. The Far truly is a wonderful book. Mwah of a heroic team working together to bring the best value to the customer, according to the principles in FAR Part 1. But the theaters around the world portray this epic adventure in, well, unconventional ways to say the least. So, if you are watching this and you are one of those actors that play this book out in one of our many government office stages, I ask you, will you play this out the way the book is written? Is there a play out there that is true to the original story? That is your challenge. Join us next time as we take a look at the captivating stage interpretations of the Federal Tax Code. Good night. Oh.